This Week on Mortgage & Company. Dollarocracy means the rule of the dollars. One dollar, one vote. Those with lots of dollars have lots of power. Those with no dollars have no power. Dollarocracy has the ability to animate dead ideas. It create. It, you can take an idea that's a bad idea, buried by the voters, Dollarocracy can dig it up and that zombie idea will walk among us. And information in this country, personal information, is the new commodity. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, independent production fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation. Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation the HKH Foundation, Barbara G. Fleischman, and by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. Welcome. Whether you were pleased or not with how your candidates and issues did in last Tuesday's election, the amount of money spent on many of the campaigns had to leave most people more dispirited than ever about our politics. In two states, local referendum battles were won by outside corporate interest pouring money into TV ads. In Washington state alone, $22 million was spent to beat back a plan to label genetically modified food. And across the country in Maine, a ballot motion to stop the building of a tar sands pipeline terminal was thwarted when oil companies pumped in hundreds of thousands of dollars to defeat it. Democrats and some forces on the left have embraced the corrupting kiss of cash as well. In Virginia, liberal billionaires, including environmentalist Tom Steyer, shelled out millions of dollars to elect Terry McAuliffe as governor. McAuliffe himself is the celebrated bagman, the croniest of crony capitalists, whose chief mission as an adult has been to raise multi-millions of dollars for other politicians while enriching himself. And as Republican Chris Christie was handily being re-elected governor of New Jersey, Democrats spent millions trying to hold down his margin in the hope of wounding his expected race for president in 2016. But between now and then, we still have the 2014 midterm elections to further line the pockets of the political class. So, Here's how you can prepare for the next avalanche of campaign cash. Read this new book, Dollarocracy, by John Nichols and Robert McChesney. John Nichols is Washington correspondent for The Nation magazine and a pioneering political blogger. The late Gore Vidal said, of all the giant slayers now afoot in the great American desert, John Nichols' sword is the sharpest. Robert McChesney is one of our leading scholars of communications and society, a professor at the University of Illinois, the author or editor of 23 books, and according to Utney Reader, one of the 50 visionaries who are changing your world. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Dollarocracy, what does that mean? Well, democracy means the rule of the people. One person, one vote. Uh, that's where the power is, the demos. Dollarocracy means the rule of the dollars. One dollar, one vote. Those with lots of dollars have lots of power. Those with no dollars have no power. So elections are the one time people have an opportunity to come in and select who's going to control the government, really weigh in on what the policies will actually be. It's the one moment of real leverage citizens have. And we think what's happened in the last generation, and especially in the last decade, is the power of citizens to act as a, an effective force has been reduced to the point of near elimination. So why rub our nose in it? I mean, everybody, as I said in the opening, knows it, knows that money and media are destroying our elections, as you say. Why another autopsy? Well, this isn't an autopsy. Uh, this is the product of three years of work. Bob and I are political junkies. I mean, there's no other way to say it. We love politics. We love covering it. We love talking about it. Uh, and we feel a sense of loss. 
we feel a sense of loss in America where our elections are no longer these great battles of ideas, but in fact, very controlled events, managed events. And so after the Citizens United ruling of 2010, which essentially freed up corporate money to flow into politics, we knew that this is a big enough pivot point that we should step back and spend the next few years looking at how an American presidential election and all the elections beneath it play out. And so we looked at the 2012 cycle from start to finish over a three, four year period. And what we determined was that we didn't know much at all about how bad it was. And so instead of the six billion that all the news headlines said was spent on the 2012 election cycle, it was actually t more than 10 billion because most of the groups that analyze it don't look at state, local, and referendum elections. And we also brought, I think, something very different to this. We're saying that as you have this inflow of money, this huge amount of money flowing in, we also have the stand down of journalism. We have lost tens of thousands of journalists, newsrooms closing down, newspapers cutting back. The World Wide Web has not filled the void by any means. And so we have a situation where massive inflow of money and the check and balance of journalism declining. You end up with almost a perfect situation for propagandizing the American people, for managing their debates into a narrow zone where those with the money will invariably prevail. Let me be particular for a moment. Mm -hmm. Look what's happening to local television stations. In just the last few months, Gannett Company offered $1.5 billion for the 20 local stations of the Belo Corporation based in Dallas. The Tribune Company, $2.7 billion for 19 local stations. Sinclair Broadcast mm -hmm. Group, which is the nation's biggest owner of stations, $1 billion for seven more stations. One analyst calls it a renaissance for the local television business. He says it's the best it's been in a long time. More big companies buying more local news stations. But is it good for the country? Well, the fact of the matter is that what has made local television boom in recent years is political ads. That 10 billion we talk about, roughly 6 billion of it, goes into political ads. These folks aren't buying those stations to, because we want to really help democracy. They're buying them to make money. And here's one of the From things- From political advertising. Well, among other things, admittedly. But here's one of the things we chart in the book that is absolutely blew our mind. In the 2012 cycle, there were local stations in big battleground states where they actually shaved minutes off the local news so they could fit more ads in. In one circumstance, we looked at a situation where they expanded the time period set aside for local news, and you're like, great, we have this intense election. You must really want to tell us more. No, they expanded it so that they could get more ad revenue because citizens go to the local news to find out about politics. But when you're shaving the newscast, when those citizens show up to get information, the information's coming from the ads, not from the news. Yep. And there are many countries in the world, the Scandinavian countries, for instance, which are, they basically ban political ads. They allow party election broadcasts, which are very structured. Because? But because they say, at the time of an election, people need news and information, not you know, some sort of managed statement from candidates that might actually cause them to think badly about the other candidate. I think this is something that most Americans, because are unfamiliar with if they're under the age of 65 or 70, that our elections weren't like this for the first 170 years of American history prior to the 1960s. And even in the 1960s and 70s, the amount of political TV advertising was much smaller for campaigns. So there were only a handful of ads that were negative relative to the lion's share of TV candidate ads, which were positive and about the candidate. But increasingly, they've become more and more negative over time, to the point that by 2000, roughly half of them were negative. And I think we haven't seen the final tally for 2012, but probably 85, 90% in that range of ads uh, were we negative. Know, we know that in some key Senate races, it Almost was way all. over 90%, in the, some cases close to 100%. The closer the race, the more negative ads you see. And these, Trying to demolish the other, yeah. uh, uh, your opponent, and also turn people off. That's, well, that's why you right. call it voter suppression. That's right. And so, yeah, it basically all you're getting are messages that are telling you that candidates are horrible from either side. It's going to make people not want to participate. What we're doing is squeezing the enthusiasm, the energy, the hope out of our politics and making it a drudgery for citizens. Politics shouldn't be drudgery. I'm never as angry about anything as I am about people who blame the American people for what's wrong. Because the fact of the matter is, we have very, very wealthy people who spend a lot of time with very, very smart people 
trying to figure out how to manipulate and manage our politics so that it is negative and ugly and a drudgery. Norway just had elections a couple months ago. They had around an 80% turnout. Mm -hmm. Germany just had what they said was one of the most boring elections in their history, and they had around a 72% turnout. In 2012, in an incredibly intense election, 53% of America voted. In 2010, when Republicans swept to power, 37% participated. We're getting the measure of what's happening. It, it, people are opting out. One of the antidotes should be journalism. And we all know what's been happening to newspapers and magazines. So is there any real competitiveness left in commercial, serious commercial journalism? The commercial basis of journalism that we've understood for the last century that's produced vast fortunes and household names is dying. It's dying rapidly and it's not Advertising coming. supported journalism. Advertising, right? commercial journalism. Right. Uh, advertising supported. And, the, and this has only become clear in the last few years and it's a right. point that can't be exaggerated. As advertising has gone online, it's not supporting websites that do journalism like it supported magazines or TV shows or newspapers. Instead, they go through digital ad networks run by companies like Google and Microsoft and AOL and Yahoo that basically you buy your demographic and they find people wherever they are on the web. They no longer have to go to a website and support the website's content production. As a result of that, the, journal, the commercial journalism model is online is non-existent. It really, there's no hope for it. And it changes everything because it means now we're accustomed to a certain number of reporters, a certain number of news media to have a, a functional democracy. Well, it's disintegrating mm -hmm. in city after mm -hmm. city. We talk to journalists, we go into city after city and we say to old timers, we say, how many paid reporters are there in your city today? Editors, reporters, it includes sports, weather, the works, editorials function compared to a generation ago in your city. And there's not a single city I can think of where anyone said that there's, you know, at least half are gone. And this includes digital, so we're including anyone who's making a buck online. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it's much lower than that, especially in small cities, it's like a plague has hit the city. There's just hardly anyone covering the community. That means they're not covering elections, they're not covering the relationship of government to commercial interest. All this has disappeared and it's not coming back. You know, as we travel around and, and as we look at, at the reality of, our, of how our media system is developing, one of the things you realize is that digital media and, and the, the internet is a rapidly evolving zone. And you say, well, how do people make money there? Well, how do they make money on the internet? Boy, it's, it's hard, right? They've struggled in all sorts of ways to do it. But one of the things they figured out is when you gather all this data on people, when you really find out a lot about them, then if, if you crunch that data, if you mine it right, you can figure out where they're at yep. and you can follow them online. This is the key to it. In the old days, you open up a newspaper, there's an ad there. I may want, not want to look at that ad, but as the story kind of winds around it, I may notice it. Television, I'm watching it, the ad pops up, I'm, not, I'm too lazy to get up and walk out, so I watch that. Radio in the car, the ad comes on, I hear it. In the digital world, they don't have to put the ad on the page that I'm looking at. They can go right to me. They can track and follow me as I go from place to place. Even when you buy an ad, right? Let's say you buy an ad on a digital news site. Um, the big reward for designing uh, you know, that ad and where you go to is when somebody clicks on the ad to go look at a coat or some shoes, you make the next site so exciting that they never go back. And so we have effectively created a situation where advertising on the web is designed to lead people away from journalism, not to it. You remind me that when AOL bought Huffington Post two years ago, the CEO at the time, Tim Armstrong, ordered the company's editors to evaluate all future stories according to their, and I'm quoting, <laughs> profitability consideration. Translate that for us. What that means is that the commercial pressures on journalism today are so immense that they're finding ways to raise money that the traditional standards of commercial journalism was the editors and reporters did their job well and they would automatically get an audience and then the advertising people could sell the ads and they wouldn't really have to have too much contact. And there was sort of a separation of church and state as the saying went in news media. That's disappeared. Now the reporters and the editors have to be every bit as cognizant of the commercial value of what they produce as the advertising salespeople had to be. You must have seen the story that Time Inc. has abolished the position of editor-in-chief and the editors of all of Time's magazines will now report to the business side through a new senior 
content yeah. officer. What does that tell you? Well, what it tells us is time's catching up with just about everybody else. And this is the painful reality. You know, when broadcast media came into being, uh, and it was initially thought of as a service, right? You didn't expect to make a profit off the news. Well, uh, give credit to the folks at 60 Minutes. They showed you can make right. money doing news. And so now in broadcast media for a long time, news shows have been profit centers. They're supposed to make money. They're supposed to, to have a return. Uh, we've seen this come into newspapers now. Newspapers are expected to return massive profits for their investors, uh, even in tough times. And the problem with that is that the least profitable stories are the ones for, of, about working class people in tough neighborhoods. That's the old afflict the comfortable, comfort the afflicted journalism that we that I was trained in journalism school was important. Um, that doesn't fit into a profitability calculus. When Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post for $250 million, what was lost in the story was that if he tried to buy the Washington Post 13 years earlier, he probably would have had to spend $5 billion, something, yeah. something in that area. And the reason is that the commercials, Wall Street has decided you can't make money doing journalism anymore. That's why we have so few journalists. And you know, the, the reason Bezos is interested in it was less for commercial reasons than for political influence. You still have great political influence when you own a, a monopoly daily newspaper, especially in the nation's capital. Journalism's gotta be understood first and foremost as a public good. It's something society needs, but the market doesn't produce in sufficient quality or quantity. Oh, you dreamer, you. No, but wait, this is, it's not a dreamer. Um, advertising gave the illusion that journalism could be a commercial entity and the market would take it wonderfully. But it doesn't. Now that advertising is leaving, we can see that isn't the case. If we just rely on the market, we will not have journalism. But this isn't a dreamer. This is actually not just how other countries have figured it out. All the other most democratic nations of the world have large subsidies and investments in journalism. But this country was founded on that notion. We actually were the pioneers of understanding the importance of investing in a free press to have the a founders. free society. The founders. Yeah, yeah. The first century it, of American history is all about massive public subsidies through the post office and printing subsidies mm -hmm. to create the most diverse, uh, dissenting news media ever known in the human race. Everybody says to us, what's the new model? What's the new model for paying yeah. for journalism? As if um, you know, there's going to be some sort of magical calculus that comes up. And over time, we came to the conclusion that the answer is actually very simple. We found the model. We got it. It's established. It's working. It's very, very functional. Um, Germany, Norway, Britain, all the countries with which we might compare ourselves all have massively funded public and community media. They make sure that there is an independent, non-government control. They create strong firewalls. The model is there. The problem is, in the United States, we have ended up in a horrible situation where the basic questions about funding the journalism we, the people, need to know what's happening, how, to know how to be participants fully in our democracy, that we have debates in Congress about Big Bird. And what we say to journalists and to citizens, to civic activists is, we, we can't play this game anymore. We have to step up and demand massive funding. Meanwhile, the downward pressure, as you know, on wages and working conditions for reporters is accelerating. I talked to a young journalist, well, he's 40 years old, and he said, 15 years ago, I could get by on $25,000 a year. I make $40,000 a year now, and I can't, I, I, I'm not able to do it. We're losing a generation of young people who desperately want to be reporters for the right reason, who really believe in the importance of journalism, but they simply can't find gainful employment. There's one other issue that's here that we're starting to see too that's even as important. When journalism loses its institutional basis and strength, then people in power no longer respect journalism. Mm -hmm. One of the striking findings in the last year was when the Committee to Protect Journalists, for the very first time in its history, did a report on oppression and suppression of journalist activity in the United States by the government. Now we've got reports by credible groups, the Committee to Protect Journalists, on how our government is hassling journalists and whistleblowers in America who are just trying to do their job. That's a frightening thing, and that's the consequence of having a weak media, not having an independent media. The people in power now aren't that scared of working them over. What we document in the book is the painful struggle of people who love their communities and are trying to do it at the local level. You can, I do believe that in the internet world you can cobble together an existence, maybe even a, a decent and powerful one, if you're dealing with the biggest issues of the day, 
But the fact of the matter is that for a working class family in Toledo, Ohio, the biggest issue of the day may be food stamps and, or it may be um, layoffs or it may be something else happening in that town. We need a full newsroom in Toledo, Ohio. We need a full newsroom in Steubenville. What we find painfully as we go across the country is young people in every community who are trying as hard as they can, but the avenues just aren't there. And if we don't intervene pretty soon, seriously, we're going to have communities that literally are dead zones as regards media coverage. Isn't that, to be blunt about it, isn't capitalism as it's presently functioning the core cause of the decline and a almost fall of journalism? Uh, well, of, of the dollar democracy, actually. I think the, the broader tension is between capitalism and democracy, which has been a tension in the United States really from the beginning, but especially since the Industrial Revolution and the great industrial fortunes began in the Gilded Age. You know, we've had great waves in the United States in which democratic forces won amazing victories. It's not, our history is a history of victory and defeat from this vantage point of democracy. We won the right for labor unions. We won the best public education in the world for working class people, higher education for a higher percentage of the people than anywhere else in the world. You know, we won a number of victories, Social Security, Medicare, that made this a much better country. And in that sense, your question is absolutely right. This, this sense of capitalism having to dominate and being antithetical to democracy comes from the capitalists. It comes from, they're saying, we don't work well in democracy. We need to basically have a really weak democracy, or what we call a dollarocracy, for our system to function. It's clearly true that their world, the world we live in today, and they've won, let's be clear, their world is not one that works for the rest of us. And we're really in the classic moment we were in in the progressive era, the New Deal, and the 1960s, where people have to come together and assert the popular power uh, to say we need policies in the governing system that works for us, not just for them. But don't you think that corporate America knows that both parties are up for sale? Sure. I, I mean, that's not a, I don't think that's a debatable point at, at, at this time. What we're really talking about is monopoly. We're talking about creating a situation where you really can kind of control things at all levels. And, um, and certainly controlling political parties, controlling the politics is a very, very important thing. We talk a lot to politicians, to elected officials and former elected officials. And one of the things that fascinated us is the extent, the extent of their frustration. Literally saying, you know, we're becoming spectators to this thing. The politics is literally playing out now beyond the parties. It is independent groupings coming in, spending more on an election campaign than the parties themselves do or the candidates do. And here's what really happens. Those who have a lot of money uh, and, and have a lot of desire to influence the process, they come into it as transactional players, not transitional players. They do not want to... Meaning? They don't want to change everything. What they want to do is make sure things work for them. And... We have a, an exchange here. I give exactly. you the money, and in and return, I get a political outcome, a policy outcome. I get a loophole. I get yeah. a tax break. What really matters is the shaping of the debate. What is the range of debate that is allowed in America? You know, what are we going to argue about? The fact of the matter is, our debate has become fully shaped by the money, and whichever party comes to power. You know, you may have a party, Democrats might be a little better on some issue, Republicans on some, but whichever party comes to power, at the end of the day, there's very little pushing of the limits of that debate. Last weekend on all the Sunday talk shows, there wasn't a word about the cuts in, in food stamps that went into effect that weekend, even though it was, those cuts were going to mean some kids and some families lost meals. What does that tell you? Well, what it tells me is that that dollarocracy has prevailed, right? I mean, that that... What you can do in a dollarocracy is you can buy the debate. That doesn't mean that you'll win every election. That's not the point. But what it does mean is that even if you lose, you can turn around, spend a little more money, and come right back. I'll give you an example from the 2012 election cycle. I don't think anyone missed that 2012 election cycle was about Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. If anybody was, was missing the point, Mitt Romney helped him out by putting Paul Ryan on the ticket as his running mate. So we had absolute clarity. Paul Ryan said, this is an election about big ideas. Well, people went to the polls. We had our election. Obama wins by 5 million votes, overwhelming majority in the Electoral College. Well, it's roughly a year later, we've got this, you know, now we have a conference committee on the debt. And what is everybody coming in and talking about? Well, maybe we can pull together a grand bargain um, where we can tinker around on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Well, with all due respect, 
I thought we settled that issue. We didn't settle it because dollarocracy has the ability to animate dead ideas. It create, it, you can take an idea that's a bad idea, buried by the voters, dollarocracy can dig it up and that zombie idea will walk among us. So when the conservative majority on the Supreme Court decides to monetize free speech, free speech becomes bought speech, we get what? What happened in the Citizens United case is that it really had no effect whatsoever for 99% of the population. Some, very few people spend so much money that being unleashed from existing laws would affect them. Most people don't give money at all, and those right. that do only give 50 or 100 $200. And the idea, though, that, that, that sp spending $25 and $250 million is the same is untenable. And what we chronicle in the book is how there's a qualitative shift once you get above a certain amount, whatever it might be, a few thousand dollars, uh, where you're spending, like John said, in a transactional sense. You're spending with results in mind. It's part of your business model. It's not about your civic duty. It's buying the government. And so we see people like Sheldon Adelson, who says he's for socialized medicine, believes in science, has all sorts of other viewpoints that people would say, well, this guy should be a liberal Democrat. But it concedes when I'm investing in candidates, I'm looking for someone who's going to deal with taxes, and I don't like labor unions. The Koch brothers, if you looked at some of the Koch brothers' donations they make, you know, they're, they, they're against the Patriot Act. They're concerned about militarism. They're for gay marriage. They're concerned about marijuana laws. They want to legalize marijuana. You look at all these things they support, you know, well, these guys must be hanging out with George Soros. <laughs> then you look at the candidates they support without exception. And the criteria for their candidates in all the election support are very simple. Are you going to lower my taxes? Are you going to weaken labor? Are you going to make sure there's no regulation of business? Are you going to basically do stuff that supports our business and our view of how business should dominate society. And so they end up supporting candidates like Ken Guccinelli, Ken Guccinelli in, Virginia, in Virginia, who on all those other issues they support, marijuana, civil liberties, is horrible, gay rights, women's rights, but uh, he's with them on class issues and they invest mm -hmm. purely for business and class issues. The other side of the issue is that Democrats were left with the choice of one of the most notorious bag men in the history <laughs> of the party. Terry McAuliffe yeah. spent his lifetime raising money for Democratic candidates, including the Clintons, and made himself rich in the process. He said in his own book that governors are good because they have favors to give away. In other words, transactional well, politics. But, and that's who Democrats in in Virginia were left to vote for. But this is the crisis of our politics, Bill. When, when you've created a dollarocracy, right? If you're gonna play, how do you play? You figure out how to raise money. Now, Terry McAuliffe is the realization of, of an awful lot of the trends that we've talked about because he's never been elected to office in Virginia before this gubernatorial race. His great skill, or a lot of his great skill, was as a political fundraiser. And this is the power of dollarocracy. It takes ideas out of the process, and it puts tactics, skills, maneuvering, manipulation to the front of the process. That's what matters. And it's amazing we get the turnout we do. This has been called the year of the liberal billionaire. In Virginia, Mayor Bloomberg spending $3 million on a guns regulation. You have Tom Steyer, who's a hedge fund manager, worth several billion dollars, spending lots of money on climate change. I mean, billionaires, millionaires are setting the agenda for what is discussed. What we're seeing with the rise of the so-called liberal billionaire who cares about social issues and maybe the environment, but what we're seeing is that billionaires have become the only real citizens of our times. They're the ones who get to pay for candidates. They're the ones who get to run for office. We know, for example, of a leading liberal uh, left wing political campaign consultant who organizes political campaigns for liberals across the country now refuses to take on new candidates unless they're already millionaires, unless they've got enough money to buy their way in. It's not worth his time. So basically, even to be opposed to money in politics, you've got to be a, a millionaire or a billionaire to even play in the game. We have a situation now where billionaires get to bankroll the media we have. Now that advertising is leaving, they're the only ones who get to pick what, who gets to be, be involved as a journalist. The Nation magazine, your magazine, published an excerpt from your book earlier this fall, and it prompted a lot of letters, including this one from a reader in Georgia. Let me read it to you. I'm sure John Nichols and Robert McChesney are correct about the threat to democracy posed by money, but I've grown weary and apathetic reading about the powerful rich and how they are buying America. Most Americans like me feel more and more helpless in the face of moneyed power. 
Tell us how to fight for democracy and don't say, go out and vote. We do that. Until you can give me a solution, no more articles on democracy sliding into decay. And her name is Virginia S. Anderson from LRJ, Georgia. Bob and I are probably as big a pair of optimists as you'll ever meet. And, and the fact is that we have a, a great belief in what political theorists and political scientists refer to as critical junctures, points in history where things get to a, a level where something has to happen. That is the American story. The, it, it is not true that the arc of history bends steadily toward justice. The arc of history kind of bends, it gets broken, it bends again, we repair it. But when you reach a real critical juncture, when things get really serious, all of American history tells us that Americans actually start to get serious as well. We let things get pretty bad before we act. There's this enormous movement that's already taken place beneath the surface that's mm -hmm. not known. We see it all over the country. It's part of our optimism. What is it? Where it's, is it? It's, it's movement that's first of all to amend the Constitution, to take money out of politics, to guarantee the right to vote and the right to have your vote counted. Already in this country, 16 states mm -hmm. have already petitioned Congress to change the Constitution along these lines. It takes a long time, but I understand what you mean. Well, We've done it 27 times well, before, yeah. including lowering the voting age to 18 in my time. 500 communities have already voted. In fact, I don't think we've lost a single election. And John and I have looked at other movements like this in the last 50 or 100 years. There's nothing that compares. This is spreading like wildfire without any news media coverage. In fact, the big feet of media yeah. say impossible. It doesn't that's right. happen. Look, too complicated. And that's the crisis of it. But here's the other thing that we think is, is dramatically undercovered in America. The bipartisan and multipartisan nature of this movement. You know, I think there's too much of a tendency, and we should say it straight out, of an awful lot of people to think that reform is sort of a liberal thing, right? That, that the, the liberals want to get money out of politics and want to, you know, make our elections work. When you move down out of that, that money and media election complex in Washington, you get to states like Maine. When Maine voted to tell Congress to do a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics or to make it possible to get money out of politics, 30 Republicans voted with the Democrats. The fact is, Bill, it's happening, but the tragedy is our media so often covers what Ted Cruz is saying, what's happening in Washington, but it doesn't go out and cover what people are trying to do about a broken system. The system is, is collapsing. Mm -hmm. We're living through the pain now of a corrupt system that isn't delivering the goods. It's not addressing the great crises of our times. And that's the great despair that that brings. And then ultimately, what every individual has to do is very simple. You've got to look in the mirror and understand, you know, if you act like change for the better is impossible, you guarantee it will be impossible. That's the one decision each individual faces. You two guys don't give up. The book is Dollarocracy, How the Money and Media Election Complex is Destroying America. John Nichols, Robert McChesney, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. Take a look at this perfect headline for the age of surveillance. No morsel, too minuscule for all-consuming NSA. There it's set above a chilling account by New York Times reporter Scott Shane of how spying by the National Security Agency has spread like a contagious virus. And there's more. Another Times article reports that the CIA has been paying AT&T more than $10 million a year for access to its telephone records. Gives new meaning to the phone company's old slogan, reach out and touch someone. True, it's a dangerous world out there and someone has to keep an eye on it. But if you think that the only targets of illicit snooping are suspected terrorists, foreign dignitaries, and journalists too close to the truth, guess again. Every one of us is under the omniscient magnifying glass of government and corporate spies. Yes, remember the corporations. Their data banks cover every sector of American society, aimed, as the forward to a new book notes, at school children and mothers of school children, at church congregations, credit card members, and Facebook friends, at everybody and anybody at work or at play with the tracking device otherwise known as a cell phone. How do we respond to this smog of surveillance? Well, start by reading this book, Spying on Democracy, Government Surveillance, 
Corporate Power and Public Resistance by Heidi Bogosian. She's executive director of the National Lawyers Guild. That's a progressive legal organization started almost 80 years ago as an alternative to the more establishment American Bar Association. She's collected story after story of how innocent lives are turned upside down. Even her own group has been subjected to surveillance and eavesdropping. Heidi Bogosian, welcome. It's an honor to be here. How do you deal personally with the possibility that you might be uh, tracked, tapped, or monitored? When you write an email, when you're on the telephone, uh, certain privileged information, especially uh, between clients and attorneys or about a client with a reporter, for example, um, one must assume that is being monitored now. And we knew that years ago under the Bush administration with the warrantless wiretapping program when many organizations actually filed lawsuits saying that right. they suspected their communications were being monitored and that really changes the relationship and um, makes an organization have to travel long distances to have private communications in person with clients. You can't do as much on email or on the phone. So it's not a matter of your saying, as so many people are, well, if I'm not doing anything wrong, why should I care if anyone's watching? You've heard that, haven't of you? Of course. I think that's a very simplistic answer because when one is under constant surveillance, uh, be it from a surveillance camera on a city block, and we have so many here in New York, uh, to the possibility that internet communications are being monitored, it necessarily alters how you communicate. It makes us mm. tamp down things that we might say, and I think uh, attempt to conform more to the greater corporate surveillance state. Whether or not we realize that, we may not engage in the kind of robust dialogue with our friends or our colleagues. We may not meet at public assemblies because it's become really uh, under the watchful eye and wanting to maintain the status quo of big business. You say in your book that we've become a surveillance state, a government-corporate partnership that makes a mockery of civil liberties. Talk about that partnership. There's a revolving door, really, between the Pentagon and private business. For example, I think it's 70 percent of retired three- and four-star generals uh, then take jobs in the private sector as consultants. Uh, advising the government through work with companies such as Raytheon uh, and others about policy. Uh, and I think that's a conflict of interest. But more importantly, CEOs from many of the big uh, businesses like Boeing, Raytheon, advise the president on matters of technology and national security. And they're, they're conflicted out because their profit motive really is the duty that they have whereas the government officials have a duty to uphold the Constitution. I don't think that having 70 percent of our national intelligence conducted by private business uh, is a way to ensure that our civil liberties are really protected. You write in here that from the moment you wake up, your everyday activities are routinely subjected to surveillance. Do you think everyday Americans know that? They didn't a few months ago. Uh, I think that with the Snowden revelations and The Guardian coming forth, uh, we have a greater sense of the extent to which our communications are monitored. Uh, in fact, it seems not to be the exception, but rather the rule. Yeah, Literally the, everything is gathered. It's what you call a staggeringly comprehensive network. Tracks where we go, how long we stay, and what we browse, read, buy, and say. That's pretty exhaustive. It's exhaustive, and I think when the government says, for example, that metadata uh, that doesn't collect the contents of our communications uh, is an acceptable thing to collect, you have to realize that associations can be very easily garnered and tracked. What's metadata? Metadata shows, for example, that I called you on a Friday night. It doesn't say what we discussed, but it says that we talked. So that if I called a physician, say at a cancer clinic several times, uh, the government might surmise that I have cancer. Or if I engage in a certain political activity over a period of time, it allows them to develop a profile even though they don't know exactly what we discussed. What would they want that for? Well. 
retailers want that information because they want to develop profiles about our purchasing and spending habits. We have groups such as Axiom, which is a data aggregator that really has quite complete profiles on many of us in this country. That's a market research firm, right? It's a market research firm, and they very cleverly recently came out with a website called About the Data that allows you to go on and check what information they have about you and to correct it, therefore giving them actually more accurate information if you were to do that. Where do they get that data? They get the information from a number of public sources, uh, but they also go to retailers and may purchase it from, say, J.C. Penney, who has tracked what you've purchased from them mm. over the last year. And then they sell it to third-party companies, including the U.S. government. The problem being, of course, that they need to simplify profiles of us. They may categorize us as sort of an up-and-coming 20-year-old interested in uh, maybe starting a family or you're about to retire. But they also put in information about your political activities, your personal interests, uh, health interests, things that we may not want shared. This is the company I think Natasha Singer wrote about in the New York Times, and she said that Axiom peers deeper into American life than the FBI or the IRS. Quote, if you are an American adult, the odds are that it knows things like your age, race, sex, weight, height, marital status, education level, politics, buying habits, household health worries, vacation dreams, and so on. Why does our government contract with a market researcher? Well, the government is constricted by the Fourth Amendment's uh, provision that it may not engage in unreasonable searches and seizures. But businesses don't have those same constraints, so they can collect information about us that the government lawfully is not allowed to do. So you have said in here that data mining is the gold standard for spying on democracy now. Explain that. Well, as we've become an increasingly consumerized nation and reliant on the internet, uh, you'll know that when you do a search, for example, for a pair of shoes, you're going to be bombarded on the internet yeah. with other shoes um, from different companies. And I think that it's become hugely profitable for these organizations such as Axiom and others because they really keep this information for years on end. We don't know exactly what they do with it, but we do know that they profit handsomely from it and that really information in this country, personal information, is the new commodity. Do you think that Americans are largely in the dark uh, about what we're talking about, or do you think they now take it for granted and are complacent about it because what they're doing fits their convenience? Certainly, generations that have been brought up on the internet and taught to type on a keyboard at the same time that they learn to read have a different notion of privacy and uh, are willing, even uh, as children who may not uh, know it to give over personal information, for example, when they sign on to a Walt Disney site or even a Coca-Cola site. They uh, are bombarded again with friendly images, uh, animal-type characters that uh, ask you for your date of birth, where you live, what your preferences are. We're becoming, from a very early age, uh, accustomed to be being groomed to be consumers for life. And along with that, comes a kind of trust, I think. Uh, corporations are so much a part of our daily lives, uh, I would argue for the worse, but uh, they market themselves as our friends. And then the close partnership they enjoy with the government blurs traditional lines of what government functions have been and notions of privacy. So I think that most people who grew up on the internet may not be aware of traditional notions of privacy and are willing, as you say, for the, for the convenience that it offers us uh, and the, I think, appearance of ease of friendship and communication. But I think that we do need to take a step back and realize that protections haven't been put in place uh, along with the fast pace that technology has really sped ahead. Some people will say, well, I hear what uh Heidi Boghossian is saying, and I'm as concerned as she is about the uh, government use of data, but I'm not really concerned when she talks about the business 
uh, the corporate consequences of this because I'm buying these things knowingly. I probably assume that somebody is going to be using this data to, 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 to uh, profile me and, and, and track me. And I, I, we think there should be a distinction between our fear or concern about government uh, surveillance and corporate or business surveillance. Now, respond to that challenge. People need to know that for all intents and purposes, the distinction right now between government and the corporate world is virtually nil. They are hand in hand working to gather information about Americans as well as people across the globe to really be in a race uh, to collect more information than any other country can because I think in their eyes, having this information, storing it and be, being able to access it for years on end is, is a symbol of power and control. So that you can't really make that distinction anymore between big business and government. But, but government is looking, is it not, for that uh, needle in the haystack, that potential terrorist, that people want to stop before the terrorist strikes this country. And with the corporations and the business, aren't they looking for the person to whom they can market something? Like that? It helps me make my way through a busy life of being able to buy online. And if I have to give up a little information about myself, I, that's okay. And that's what they're telling us. And of course, that is part of it. But they're also looking to quiet those individuals who may be critical of corporate policies. And remembering how much corporations really factor into our daily lives, that should be of concern. Uh, many corporations have their own intelligence sections, for example, uh, so that they may have a unit that spies on activists. Animal rights and environmental activists are one of the prime targets because the FBI has labeled them a top domestic terrorism threat. So that if you go to a protest and you're an animal rights activist, you can expect that you're being tracked in one way or another. The National Lawyers Guild gets calls all the time about people whose families and friends have been visited by the FBI in advance of a certain, say, Republican National Convention or another demonstration wanting to know information about certain activists. Uh, they definitely have files. They, they circulate photographs. They now identify what they call the anarchist threat. Yeah. And that's basically anyone who uh, I think uh, may be continuously critical of, of government and corporate policies, who speaks out and who isn't intimidated by corporations. So they spend vast amounts of money to track these individuals. So this is why you write that corporations no longer spy merely to protect or steal trade secrets. In 2004, the Department of Homeland Security created what are called fusion centers, allegedly to better uh, streamline the coordination between local law enforcement, federal law enforcement, and businesses so that these some 75 centers across the country work hand in hand with businesses, gathering information uh, about local threat assessments, including uh, anarchist and so-called activist threat assessments. We saw that with the Occupy movement, where the Department of Homeland Security worked with financial uh, businesses and banks to let them know that there would be protests in their municipalities all around the country well before the protests started. But you say this has a fallout on, on dissent and uh, truth-telling? When you are afraid to go, for example, to a mass assembly because you know that law enforcement will be there in riot gear with so-called less lethal munitions, when you know that corporations have done their research, gathered dossiers on you, may have their own private security guards, as they do now at most protests, uh, it makes people who maybe have never gone to a protest before, who want to express a view on something, afraid of that. I think that's very uh, damaging to the notion of democracy because the streets, the public parks, which are now increasingly uh, corporatized in many urban areas, uh, don't belong to us as a people anymore. They belong to corporations. And if we're afraid to go there and congregate, uh, it's a sad testament to where we are. One of the surveillance cameras down at the side of Occupy Wall Street is still there right. a couple of years later. So what do you think is happening to us as a, as, a, as, a, as a free and democratic people? 
I think that we've been understandably enticed by all the exciting forms of technology. And I think that, of course, there are many, many wonderful uses of technology that we should harness for the appropriate reasons. I just think that our laws and our social conscience has not kept a step with those developments, that we need to take a breath and say, where are we? What do we value? Uh, what do we want to recapture in terms of our rights as Americans and our constitutional protections? And how can we balance the positive gains of technology with privacy and the laws of the land? You say, we need more troublemakers to bring us to our senses. Troublemakers. That was a quote from a judge in New York over an Occupy Wall Street case. And the judge said that Occupy uh, in effect had shown a light on these so-called troublemakers. The police department called them troublemakers. And he said that they really provide an invaluable service in terms of reminding us what's important uh, in our country. You would consider Edward Snowden a troublemaker, right? A troublemaker and a true hero and patriot. Why? Working as he did for a private corporation handling sensitive information, and being told basically that there was no problem, there was nothing he could do. He then uh, took matters into his own hands knowing that he would probably face imprisonment for the rest of his life. Uh, and I think that doing that because he saw something wrong contrary to the values um, and contrary really to I think why he went into his work, uh, make him the ultimate hero because he sacrificed his life to uphold uh, the nation's values, democracy. Could you have done that? I would like to think I'd be brave enough to do that. Uh, I'm cautious in some ways because I am a lawyer and I know I have taken an oath to uphold the law. Uh, I would like to think that I could have done that. I'm not, not sure. I really like your last chapter, which is called Custodians of Democracy. Who are the custodians of democracy? The custodians of democracy are the ordinary people that make up this country and make us so special. They believe that we can be a thriving democracy and that we do not have to cede our lives and our autonomy uh, to multinational corporations, who I think have really robbed us uh, of some of the, um, the privileges that we've been so fortunate to have over the history of this nation. And they're not afraid to stand up to leaders. I was inspired by the school child who did not want to wear a tag, an ID tag at school that had a radio frequency identifying chip in it, RFID chip. And she fought, brought a lawsuit. She had to transfer to another school, but it raised attention. And I think especially uh, when a child says, I don't want this, knowing that she can then be tracked for a number of other reasons, I applaud that courage. And um, there's a community in California, for example, that went to their city council meeting and said, you've just approved having a surveillance drone in this area, and we don't like that. And they put pressure on their elected officials and there's not going to be a surveillance drone there. And the custodians of democracy, they're not afraid to take action that may get them in trouble, get them expelled from a school, for example, or even arrested. They take to the streets, they speak out, and they lead by example, by doing something that unfortunately uh, has required a great deal of bravery in what should really be uh, the ordinary way we conduct our lives. Well, one way to become a custodian of democracy is to read Spying on Democracy, Government Surveillance, Corporate Power, and Public Resistance. Hadi Boghossian, thank you very much for being with me. Thank you so much. Last week, after our report on the innocent lives taken by U.S. drone strikes, I asked what you thought. I'm still reading your responses. There have been more than 1,500. At our website, BillMoyers.com, you can see a summary. Now I want to ask you to do it again. 
this time in response to my conversation with Heidi Bogosian. Here's the question. Just how comfortable are you with this constant invasion of privacy? When, if ever, is it justified? You can write me on Facebook or at BillMoyers.com. I'll see you there, and I'll see you here next time. Don't wait a week to get more Moyers. Visit BillMoyers.com for exclusive blogs, essays, and video features. This episode of Moyers & Company is available on DVD for $19.95. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, Independent Production Fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation. The HKH Foundation. Barbara G. Fleischman. And by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America. Designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company.